I'm going to go ahead and, uh, since again, you don't want to listen to me all day, introduce our speaker, our guest speaker. Hannah Zach Miley is an author who has been increasingly in demand as a public speaker in both the U.S. and internationally. I had the occasion recently to meet Hannah and her husband, George, who's sitting next to her. Welcome, George. And learn more about their work and about Hannah's incredibly moving personal story. Hannah was born in, Germ in the German city of Bonn in 1932, just 11 months before Hitler seized power. Her Jewish parents, Marcus and Amelie Zach, sought ways of escape for the next seven years. In 1939, they were able to get Hannah onto a train to escape England as part of the kinder transport rescue effort that is ultimately credited with saving 10,000 Jewish children. Not only would Hannah never see her parents again, she would also not know anything about her parents' fate until many years later, at age 75, Hannah would embark on an effort to uncover the details of her parents' story. She learned that her parents did not make it to safety. They were stripped of their businesses, forced from their home, and deported to endure six months in the Wuj ghetto before being gassed by the Nazis in Poland on May 3rd, 1942. Before we have Hannah deliver her message to you all, please turn your attention to the screen for a brief trailer of an upcoming documentary of Hannah's story. The Kinder Transport refers to the rescue of children with Jewish origins from Nazism between 1938 and 1940. The total number of Jewish children who perished in the Holocaust was one and a half million and 10,000 were rescued by the Kinder Transport and I was number 8814 of those 10,000. After I left my parents, they were gassed in a grey truck on May the 3rd, 1942. And you know, I think to myself, if my father had not put me on that train, I would have been standing between them in that truck. What struck me particularly was the element of conciliation. Despite her pain at losing her parents, despite her anger, despite everything she'd been through, for the first time, I took conciliation seriously. It can be heartfelt and sincere and meaningful and really made me change the way I regarded it. Today, I see so much marginalization of people and a lot of hatred and division. It's only as an adult that I've been able to really appreciate what it means to have life. And it really makes me very passionate to tell the story. Mr. Speaker, and thank you, esteemed members of the House of Representatives, dignitaries and guests. It is an honor for me to address you on this special day, a day of fresh beginnings. I think God must have a sense of humor. Today, there is no famous person, no young, virile sports celebrity, or acclaimed musician to give this speech. <laughs> Only a small 90-year-old woman. And then, I think, of Polly Rosenbaum. 
She was born in 1899 and died in 2003 at the age of 104. And she sat in this room for 46 years. While on a tour of this house, I noticed so many portraits and sculptures honoring past members. I stopped and took a long look at the sculpture of Polly Rosenbaum, and I was inspired by her kindness and the strength of her character. So, why did Speaker Tome ask me to come here today? As you've heard on the video, I was born in Germany in 1932, and that was an unfortunate time. I was 11 months old when Hitler seized power. An only child, I lived with my parents in Gmünd, a small idyllic town between the Rhine and the Belgian border. We were Jews. Gradually, slowly, our sense of security faltered. In my mind's eye, even today, I can still see my first school books. For arithmetic, we added and we subtracted and we multiplied bright, colorful flowers, balls and tops. Suddenly, one day, we had new books with different pictures. Now we counted guns, tanks, helmets, and marching soldiers in dull colors and camouflage. I vividly remember a hot summer day walking between my parents in the hills above town. We stopped and we looked down at the new swimming pool glittering in the sun. We heard people laughing, splashing and swimming. I looked up at my father and I said, I want to go there. His expression changed and he quietly and sadly repeated the words written at the entrance, no Jews allowed. Like nearly all the Jewish community in Gimund, my parents hoped that the madness wouldn't last until Kristallnacht, the night of November the 9th and 10th, 1938, when hate-filled words became violent acts, when our synagogue was destroyed by fire, like synagogues all over Germany. In a strange way, that night saved my life. By then, my parents were not allowed to leave Germany, but my father was galvanized by the violence, and he found a place for me on the kinder transport, a rescue effort to bring Jewish children from Germany, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Austria to Britain. Almost 10,000 children were saved, and I was number 8814. I left in the evening of July the 24th, 1939, only five weeks before World War II broke out. I was seven years old when I arrived in Britain, losing my language, my culture, bereft of my parents, their protection and love. I tried to fit in and become a nice English girl and block out my early life. But by the time I was a young adult, I became aware that inside there seethed 
anger, bitterness, unacknowledged loss, and loneliness. I could no longer suppress my past, my sense of injustice, my hatred for Germany and Germans. And it was when I reached the end of my rope that I had an unexpected, life-changing encounter. A light penetrated my inner darkness. For the first time since my childhood, I heard that I was not alone. In that vivid experience, that unforgettable exchange when I could open my heart and face the turmoil within and give my own wrongness, my despair, and also the wrongs that had been done to me, to my heavenly father. I sensed him saying, come to me, bring those intolerable burdens to me and find rest for your soul. I can still remember the lifting of that dark weight as I gave it all to him. And today, right now, as I'm sharing that with you, I marvel at the consequences, the fallout from that personal encounter all those years ago. But you know, it's one thing to make an internal transaction and to taste inner release and freedom following a conscious decision to forgive while living in a quiet English town miles away from the past and all that bitterness toward Germany and Germans. The question is, does it hold? Is it real? Is it real when you meet face to face with a direct descendant of a Nazi? Verena is the daughter of a Nazi. Her father was part of the Austrian political leadership welcoming Hitler when he marched into Austria on the 13th of March, 1938. After the war, her father was convicted and imprisoned as a Nazi. Verena was a baby at the time. She grew to love her father. He was a cultured, gifted man. When she learned of her father's complicity with evil, a struggle began within her. There was a tension between loyalty and shame, and it even affected her physical health. Verena, like me, came to the end of herself. She was the daughter of a Nazi. I was the daughter of Jewish parents who were gassed in the Holocaust. And yet, we share similar stories. We follow the same path in our common experience of healing, forgiveness, and freedom. On Monday, the May the 3rd, 2010, Verena and I stand close together with eight friends before a locked iron gate in a small Polish village. Chelmno. We're peering through metal bars at a scrubby, barren ground, the place where a grey gas van had been parked. We are there on the anniversary of the day my parents took their last breath, packed together with other Jewish bodies in just such a gas van on May the 3rd, 1942. Suddenly, I become aware. Verena has slid to her knees 
and is quietly weeping. I join her on the stony, dusty ground and we embrace mingling sorrow, repentance and forgiveness. I marvel at the levels of healing we both experienced, the child of a victimizer and the child of victims, drawn together by our Heavenly Father. Last October, we met again, Verena and I, this time in the Jewish cemetery in Gemünde, Germany, my hometown for the first seven years of my life, and where George, my husband, and I had erected a memorial stone to my parents. We were in Germany to film a documentary telling my personal story of the Holocaust as a message of hope and a warning. We embraced and shared heart to heart and looked back in wonder at our journey together into reconciliation. We recounted the times we had shared the truth about our history. Verena recalled her sorrow and her request for forgiveness for her father's role in the genocide of my people. There in Chelmno, and I remembered my response to forgive, something totally beyond my natural ability. Surely a gift from heaven, this release and freedom we experienced together. And so, back to the present, here in a place that echoes with the words spoken and decisions made over so many years, votes cast that affected the everyday lives, the hopes of our neighbors. Words and decisions that revealed to a watching world the state of our union, who we are in Arizona, So what motivated me to say yes when the speaker invited me to be here today? A twofold answer. I deeply respect the role you play in the future of our state. And I believe each of us in the privacy of our own hearts aspires to leave the world a better place. And I bring both warning and hope because my personal and family experience of the Holocaust, I watch with concern the rise of hostility and cruelty throughout the world. And I long for my home state, Arizona, and this house to be a light in this present darkness. Thank you for the privilege of honoring my parents and sharing my redemptive story with you on this historic day in this place. I would like to end with an ancient Jewish prayer calling for blessing on your lives and the work you will do. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Thank you.